and I actually really appreciate it, I think, building on what Julie just said, that it's grounded in reality and it's not just aspirational. And I think that's really important. Um, with that said, I think that one of the interesting things for me in this would be that without better transportation and without reducing congestion and the frustrations that people have, basically parking and congestion on the roads and that, you're not going to get the political support in a lot of these communities to build the amount of housing that we need. And you start to see a backlash when people can't use the roads and, and all of that. And so, for me, I, I think one of the interesting things that's going on, at least in our research park in Palo Alto, is it's becoming a, a hub of self-driving cars, new technologies and mobility. And here you have Ford opening their research center, you have Tesla, having a research, obviously, center there. You have Mercedes. You have Google with self-driving cars. And I attended a presentation recently by Carl Gardino down in, in um, San Jose, which talked about how we could double our road capacity if we had self-driving cars. But it could go two ways. You could have just expensive cars that can be self-driving. And in a mixed flow lane, you don't get those benefits. Whereas if you have all the self-driving cars, in the same way. And this could either go quickly, where you get lots of self-driving cars, which would change the entire, the entire framework of this plan in transportation, which would allow more housing to be built, frankly. It would allow less congestion on the roads. It would get us out of what I actually view as a box in the Bay Area, in which there doesn't seem a way to meet the goals that people have. I mean, people are unhappy that you know, a lot of these housing issues were going in the wrong way. And obviously the solution is to build a lot more housing. But how do we get that political will? And it's probably too late in this plan to do that kind of stuff. But I really hope when we start doing the next iteration of these plans, we start looking at that. We look at issues of what are the roadblocks? What would we need to change? And how would we advocate for that change? I mean, one of the things I notice is that Uber, Uber, is doing their self-driving cars in Pittsburgh, where you actually will have a self-driving car with no one driving it, showing up in Pittsburgh. And if any of you have driven the new Tesla, you know, the Teslas with somebody, who go down the highway, you know, that it's not a self-driving car, but it definitely drives down the freeway, and it changes its lanes, and you could basically not do much. So I think that's coming faster than we tend to think it is. But there's probably legislative changes and stuff that we need to make this kind of stuff a reality. Um, so just transitioning a little to another issue. When I read the staff report, the part that I'm most confused on is the part about how urban sim, the model, plays into comments you receive from us. So if I say, for instance, that Palo Alto has too much housing or too little housing or, you know, whatever, and you could, how does that play? What comments are you looking for? Are you looking for me to say, you know, we actually have a general plan here that provides more housing than you have, and if so, what do you do with that information? And you put it into the urban sim model, then you, do you rerun it? Now, do you rerun it with, if everybody comes to you and says, hey, I heard Sam Licardo in San Jose, too much housing, not enough jobs. So. You know, do you put that into this urban sim model and it changes again? Or do we make adjustments outside the urban sim model? Maybe you could just address how, how the comments that you get from people actually flow into something and how that changes. Or if it's higher level stuff, we should be telling you. And what, like for instance, we want less displacement. What would it take to do that? Or we want more housing units. What would it take to do that? I, I'm unclear on the feedback. I'm really supposed to give. So if you just address that. Sure, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this as quick as possible. So sort of going from your last comment back, um, I mean, the, we want your comments on all of the things that you described. We want the policy level comments that are regional, but also get down to the local level. It's really important that we get that, especially from the regional policymakers. In terms of the jurisdictional input, we do want to hear if a jurisdiction thinks its, its housing numbers are too high or they're too low or jobs high or low. Um, and the first thing we will do is look at what we have and see is 
is it an error? And I'll give one example. The city of Mill Valley, almost within seconds after I hit send, <laughs> hit, they hit reply and said, we, th we think something's seriously wrong here. And it turns out they were correct. And there were, there were a couple of parcels that were coded incorrectly. And we went in and looked at that. We made the correction. And their housing number was actually much closer to what they expected. They're probably not the only jurisdiction like that. There are other jurisdictions where, you know, the jobs numbers for many jurisdictions in the region are very high. And as Julie said, in part, what we're looking at is where, are, where is job growth happening? Where is it likely to happen in the future? Um, how does that relate to regional goals and the plan? And again, there may be a lot of information we don't have yet that we want to receive. That's the case with San Jose. Um, but we do want that kind of input, and, and it won't always be in every case that whatever the jurisdiction says, we'll be able to say, well, that's exactly what the plan is going to say, because the regional plan and a local plan aren't exactly the same thing. But that input is really important, and we'll make adjustments as we can. Okay. Thank you.